Don't we need that amazing grace? Doesn't your neighbor need that amazing grace? Doesn't your children need that amazing grace? Doesn't your wife, your husband need that amazing grace? I feel the Spirit of God in this place, do you? Matthew 18 verse 15 says, If your brother or sister sins against you, go and tell them their fault in private. Let me read it on the screen. <laughs> if another believer sins against you, go what? Privately and point out the offense. If the other person listens, and confesses it, you have won that person back. I struggled as to whether I should share the story that I'm going to begin with. But it's, it's our world today. I was reading on the news about a family. You had a young man who was 16 and a sister who was 20 and a brother who was 11 and a mom. And the brother and the sister were dueling about he wanted to play the video game and she wanted to do something else. And so he changed the Wi-Fi password and wouldn't give it to her. And so she confronted him and they got in a heated fight. And eventually as they started fighting, I'm sure they fought all the time. The brother held the sister in a chokehold. The little brother who was 11 was watching. And the mom was there trying to tell him, hey, let her go, let her go. And he held her for 15 minutes. And when he let her go, she was dead. He was placed in prison for life. In one day, a mom lost two children and was left with one who was forever traumatized. And as I think about the story, conflict is destructive. Conflict is destructive. And if we fail to deal with it in constructive ways, it can cause irreparable damage. So how do we respond to conflict in such a way that it promotes peace and healing? Jesus says again, if your brother or sister sin against you, what should you do? Go and rebuke him or her in private. If they listen, you've won them over. My first point this morning is that conflict is inevitable. The Greek word that is used is if your brother or sister sins against you. And the term for if in the Greek is a general conditional sentence. In other words, Jesus is assuming that your brother and sister will sin against you. It's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. And so Jesus says, assuming your brother and sister will sin against you, this is how you should respond. In other words, conflict is inevitable. And it's no difference in the church. Your brother and sister will rub you the wrong way. Your brother and sister will get on your nerve. Your brother and sister will make you want to punch them in the face. Conflict is inevitable. Jesus says it will happen. It's not going to be kumbaya, we're in heaven. Can we all just get along? There will be church fights. 
Why? Because we are different. Why? Because we are sinners. And we all won't see things the same way. And so Jesus assumes that there will be conflict. He doesn't say it's foreign and it's not going to happen in his church. He says, disciples, you're going to have fights. You're going to have conflict. But what matters is how you respond. I'm going to say that again. The problem is not conflict. What matters is our response to it. Are you with me, church? Not only that, you act like you weren't upset on some occasion when, you're in, when you husband and wife were coming to church. You act like you, you and your kids don't have conflict. You and your spouses don't have conflict. You, you and your co-workers don't have conflict. You and your neighbors don't have conflict. We have conflict not only in the church, not only in our family, not only in our relationship, but it's also being played out in our world. Just watch the news. What matters is our response to it. Are you with me, church? And many times when we look at conflict, we see it as something negative. But if we deal with conflict in the right way, it can actually be something positive. Are you with me? Ken Sunday defines conflict. She says, conflict is a difference in opinion or purpose that frustrates someone's goal or desires. Another way to say that. James says conflict is the result of our desires. In other words, one person wanted it this way, and another person wanted it that way, and I'm going to have my way, and I'm going to have my way, and we don't get anywhere because it's more not about your way or my way. It's about God's ways. So conflict is a result of our desire, but if we respond to it in the right way, it can be positive. Conflict, Ken Sunday says, is not necessarily bad. In fact, the Bible teaches us, teaches us that some differences are natural and beneficial. Since God has created us unique individuals, human beings will often have, listen, different opinions, different convictions, different desires, different perspectives, and different priorities. Many of these differences are not inherently right or wrong. They are simply the result of God-given diversity and personal preference. When handled properly, disagreements in these areas can stimulate positive, productive dialogue it can encourage creativity, it can promote helpful change, and it can generally make life more interesting. Are you listening? Another guy, I believe his name is Professor Emma Oike, and in writing on conflict, he says, Sweeping conflict under a rug and refusing to acknowledge it and learn from it can cause long-standing damage. But conflict does not have to be harmful. If it is dealt with early, what did I say? And wisely, what did I say? If, it, if its causes are openly examined, it can actually serve a good purpose. Are you still with me? It can show us where change is needed and it can motivate much, motivate much needed change. It can motivate us to look at, our, at viewpoints we have overlooked, dismissed, or been unaware of but need to consider. Are you with me? Conflicts can be what? Positive. More than that, the Bible tells us that we should see conflict, listen now, neither as an inconvenience nor as an occasion to force our will on others. Are you still with me? 
but rather as an opportunity to demonstrate the love and power of God in our lives. Ken Sande goes further, conflict provides an opportunity to glorify God. Thank God for conflict. Say to your neighbor, conflict provides an opportunity to glorify God. Didn't he say, in everything, whether you eat or drink, do it all to the glory of God. So in our conflict, God can get some glory. If we respond to it the right way. Conflict provides an opportunity to glorify God. That is to bring him praise and honor by showing who he is, what he is like, and what he is doing. Say to your neighbor, I don't like conflict. But conflict can be a positive thing. <laughs> Say conflict is not the problem. What matters is my response to it. Well, let's be honest. I want to talk about how we biblically respond to conflict, but first I want to talk about how we typically respond to conflict. <laughs> when we have conflict, we have one of two responses, either to avoid or to attack. Are you with me? And so when we avoid, we're like, I'm done. I'm not going to have anything to do with you. Or when we attack, it's like, I'm going to kill you. I'm going to get you. But there's a third way. We don't have to avoid conflict. I'm done. We don't have to attack in conflict. I'm going to get you. We can address conflict. I'm still going to work this out and accept you. Are you with me? In other words, when it comes to conflict, the biblical approach is not to run from conflict. It's to resolve conflict. You should write that down and tweet it. The fact is we fear conflict. And as a result, we avoid conflict or we appease in conflict. I'm just going to give in and let them have their way and act like there's no problem. And I'm going to live with this dude or woman and be miserable. We just appease. We just give in thinking that's the way to deal with conflict. Or we just avoid. We act like conflict isn't even there. But pretending like there is no conflict doesn't make it go away. Are you with me? You got it now? <laughs> so in other words, the Bible says, blessed are the what? Peacemakers. But the only way you're going to have peace is if you address the problem. Are you with me? If you have a wound and it begins to fester, sometimes you have to address the wound and the pain and the unpleasantness in order for it to heal. In order to have peace in our life, sometimes we have to deal with unpleasant issues and work through it in order to have peace. Are you with me? So first, Jesus teaches us that conflict is what? Inevitable. It will happen. What matters is our response. We don't need to avoid. We don't need to attack. We need to face it. That's the only way we're going to resolve it. Are you ready for the steps? And how to deal with conflict. Jesus says, first, go to the person. Go to the who? Go to the person who talked about you. Go to the person who betrayed you. Go to the person who hurt you. Jesus says, go to the what? And it's crazy as I was studying this text. The first thing that God tells us to do is the last thing that we want to do. 
And we go to everybody except the person that we have the problem with. We go to our wife. We go to our husband. We go to our friend. We go to our children. We go to our co-worker. We go to the pastor. We go to everybody about the problem except the person that we have the problem with. But Jesus didn't say go to them. He says go to the person. So many times when we have conflict, we sit and we stew. <laughs> we tell everybody else. We go to everybody except the person we have the problem with. And when we go to everybody except the person we have the problem with, and we tell everybody else about the problem, we make the problem ten times worse because now that's everybody's problem. I don't think you got that. When you have a problem, the only ones that can resolve it are you and the person you have the problem with. Amen. I don't think they got that. <laughs> when you have a problem, the only two people who can resolve it are you and the person you have the problem with. You don't need to bring in everybody else. And Jesus teaches the only time you bring in someone else, you even tell them about the issue, is when you all two can't resolve it together. Somebody got me. The family therapist got me. Amen. A writer commenting on the, this Bible verse says, Do not tell others of the wrong, what the other person did. One person is told, then another, and still another, and continually the report grows, and the evil increases, till the whole church is made to suffer, all because you didn't deal with your stuff. So this writer says, settle the matter between thee and him alone. That is God's plan. Are you with me, church? And I'm guilty of this. I have a problem with people and I tell everybody else. And I don't go to the person. But that's not the biblical way. Are you with me? Sometimes people don't even know that you have a problem with them, that you're hurt until you go to them. So my wife was in, in college with her friend, and they were like best friends growing up. And I think they were freshmen in college. And out of nowhere, her and her friends stopped talking. And so throughout most of college, they stopped hanging out as friends. And so later, you know, girls, no, I'm kidding joke it's a joke <laughs> lighten up church <laughs> now nah, i'm kidding but anyway so they had this issue and and they stopped talking and so years later my wife and her friends started hanging out again and she was like hey you know why weren't you talking to me what what happened there in college and her friend said well when you and your roommate said we wanted to have more time together I felt hurt, and so I didn't have anything to do with you all. And that simply could have been prevented if one of them went to the other person and told them how they felt. But because they didn't talk about it, for years there wasn't healing. Are you with me? So when we fail to go to the person, when we fail to work things out, it prevents healing. That's why Jesus says, go to the person. I know it's scary, but it's necessary. Are you with me? And what Jesus says is also important. He says, go to your brother, go to your sister. You need to remember that that person is your brother and is your sister. And that determines how you should see them. And that determines how you should treat them. Are you with me, church? When we have conflict, the natural thing to do is to walk away. Are you still listening? But when there is conflict, the courageous thing to do is to work it out. 
And in order to do that, you have to go to who? The person. The second thing you need to do, <laughs> I like what Rick Warren says. He says, conflict is not going to be resolved by accident. You have to be intentional. You have to make the first move. The second step is to ask God for wisdom. I like the way Rick Warren says this. He says, ask God for wisdom. Don't go to the person while you're still pissed. Cool off. Cool down. Are you with me? Ask God to show you what to say. How to say it. Where to say it. And when to say it. Ask God to help you to go with a positive attitude. Not all sour and stink. But positive. Let, there's an issue, but we're going to work this out. We're family, right? And family have problems, but it doesn't have to lead to divorce. And when you go to the person, this is all just wisdom. Make sure it's in private. Maybe not while their kids are around or in the church, you know? They might get defensive. They might not listen there. But if it's one-on-one, -on -one, they might hear you out. Are you with me? So the first thing we do is we go to the person. Are you with me? The second thing we do is we ask God for wisdom. And now the third step when you go is to ask questions. To do what? The Greek that is used here, fault, literally has two Greek terms. He said to the commentator, I just remembered the first one. He said, investigate. In other words, when you go to the person, don't pretend like you know the whole story. Like you have all the facts. Are you with me? Investigate. So when you go to the person, go with a question. Go with a what? So you might say something like this. I noticed you did this. It made me think this. Am I right? Does that make sense? I noticed you did this. It made me think this. Am I right? And now you leave it open for them to respond. The fourth thing you do, this is the hard part, is to acknowledge how you, I'm going to say that again, is to acknowledge how you contributed to the conflict. Usually in a conflict, we are the protagonists. We are the good guys. And everybody else is the bad guy. Ah. Uh, in a conflict, usually we're the protagonists. We're the good guy. I'm trying to do this. I'm trying. And they're the bad people. But that's not true. We also have contributed something to cause this conflict. It takes two to tango. Like kids say, when, they're, when something happens and the parents come, he started it. She started it. Did you do that growing up? It doesn't matter. Both of you contributed to it. I heard Rick Warren say this. He says, even if 99.9% .9 of the conflict is their fault, talk about your 0.1%. Are you with me? So you need to go to them and don't talk, accuse them and say, look at what you did. Talk about your 0.1%. I was too defensive. I, wasn't think, I was just thinking about me. I didn't listen to you. God says, why are you looking at that little thing in your brother's eyes when you have a whole block in your eye? Focus on your stuff. Talk about, start with your fault. And then you will disarm the other person and they'll be willing to say, yeah, I didn't like when you didn't listen to me or I didn't like when you did this. And they'll say, I forgive you. And then they'll be more likely to share their fault. Does that make sense? The fifth thing you do, this is the, another hard one. 
when you're in a conflict is seek to understand the other person hurt and perspective. Seek to what? Understand the other person's hurt and perspective. Typically, we're wrapped up in our hurt and our perspective when we need to put ourselves in their shoe and seek to understand their hurt and their perspective. Rick Warren said something. He says, typically, we think conflict is about debating ideas. But at the root of conflict is hurt feelings. So conflict occur because somebody feels hurt. Are you still with me? Conflict occur because your son or daughter feels hurt. And that's why you and them don't have a relationship. Conflict occur because your husband or wife feels hurt. Because your children feels hurt. Because your church brother or sister feels hurt. It's not so much about debating ideas. It's more so about hurt feelings. And usually people feel hurt maybe because they've been overlooked. Maybe because they don't feel cared for. Maybe because they don't feel appreciated. Maybe because they aren't listened to. Maybe because their good is made to be evil. But whatever it is, we need to seek to understand the other person. Person's hurt. And we need to acknowledge their hurt and we need to try to see their perspective. In the Bible, Rick Warren's popped up a verse that blew my mind. He says, try to understand. This is in Romans. I don't remember the, the specific text. But Paul said to the Jews and the Gentiles who were fighting and dueling, he says, try to understand the other person's fears and doubts. Try to understand the other person's fear and doubt. Me and my wife were about to be married for seven years. We made it. August 12. If you want to sponsor us, let me know. We're going to have some fun. Want to help with the kids? Want to donate? Kidding. <laughs> but when we were first married, we had conflict, right? Because it's inevitable. And I thank God that Deirdre understood my fear and doubts. I'm about to get real. I felt, because my daddy left me when I was younger, and my mommy left me to come to America when I was like one, that my wife would leave me. And because I felt she would leave me, I was always fearful that she would see somebody and that they would do something and that I would be left behind. And that was my fear and my doubt. And when we are fearful and doubtful and insecure, we become overly controlling. So I was an insecure person who became a controlling person. Who, who's that guy that you were talking to? Are, are you with me? I was a basket case. Any other guy? Oh my God, something is happening. Lord, I'm going to be left cheated on. Because my fear was that I would be abandoned. But thank God for a woman like Deirdre. She knew and she understood my hurt. And so she didn't respond with defensiveness. She responded with love. Thank God I no longer have that fear. What I'm trying to say is something like this. Rick Warren says, people who are obnoxious, people who just get on your nerves, they need massive dose of love. He says the people who needs love the most are the people who deserved it the least. I'm going to say that again. The people who need love the most are those who deserve it the least. And I thank God that my wife understood my fear and doubt. She knew the hurt that was in my past. She saw the perspective that I was coming from. And she showed me grace. And she realized that I deserved it the least. And that's why we're still married. 
And if we learn to see the other person's hurt and the other person's doubt and the other person's fear and the other person's perspective in our church, even though we have conflict, even though we have drama, even though we have fights, we'll still be married. Are you still with me? And the sixth step, which is the last one, is to share your hurt as well. And this is important. When you go to the person, what are you doing in all of this? You're going to who? The person. You don't go by saying, you. You. <laughs> you, and then you add some words to it. <laughs> Stop acting like you. Uh. You start with I. And so you say something like this. When you did this, I felt this. Talk about how you feel. Don't attack them. Attack the problem. I'm going to say that again. Don't attack the person. Attack the problem. So when you did this, I, feel, I felt this. And I would appreciate if you do this. When you're going, I heard a, a pastor who works with churches in conflict, and he says, usually the guy asks him, well, what if one group is the, one, is the group that's right? What if one group is, is right? He says, well, really, it's not about what is wrong or what is right. It's about doing what is right. It's not about who is wrong or who is right. It's about doing what is right. And what is right is I'm not here to win an argument. What is right, I'm not here to point out your fault. What is right, I'm not going to walk away. What is right, I am here not to win an argument. I'm here to win you. Are you with me, church? We're not in this to win arguments. We are in this to win the person back. I love what Rick Warren says. He says, it is always more rewarding to resolve a conflict than to dissolve a relationship. It is always more rewarding to resolve a conflict than to dissolve a relationship. Are you still with me, church? Go to the person. Don't take it to other people. Go to the person. Are you with me? Own your part in it. Ask God to give you wisdom. Seek to understand their hurt and their perspective. And then reconcile, forgive, let it go and move on with your life. Why do we do this? Because relationship matters. Why do we do this? Are you with me, church? Because relationship matters. So because relationship matters, I'm not going to run from it. I'm going to resolve it. Because relationship matters, I'm not going to attack you. Or I'm not going to avoid you. I'm going to pursue you. I'm going to work it out. And I'm going to accept you. Because relationship matters, I'm not about winning arguments. I'm more about winning you. And when I look at Jesus, and when he went to the cross, begin playing, my brother. When I look at Jesus, and when he went to the cross, I'm glad that he didn't attack me. I'm glad that he didn't point out my faults. I'm glad that he saw. He knew my faults and he, he looked beyond my faults and saw my need. I'm glad that he didn't give up on me. I'm glad that he didn't avoid me. I'm glad that he didn't look at us and say, Father, I'm done. I can't do this. I'm done. I'm glad that he said, no, I'm going to pursue them all the way to the cross. I'm going to take responsibility for their bad behavior, even if they don't want to. And even though things look wrong, I'm going to work it out. I'm going to spill blood. I'm going to make relationship with God and people and people and people. Right. That's what Jesus did at the cross. 
So what does that mean? Reconciliation will always require that I go to the cross and die to my instinct to retaliate and alienate and instead choose to pursue relationship, forgive and reconcile. When I look at the world today, I don't like what I see, Maurice, like you said in your prayer. I don't like that we see blacks against white. We see cops against... I don't know. I don't like that we see man against woman. Republicans against Democrats. I don't like the fighting. I don't, I don't like the debating. And, and we are still suffering because people in Washington can't work it out. I don't like the division. I don't like the shooting. I don't like the hate. I don't like the picture of what I see in the world. And I'm sad to say that when we come to the church, even though we call ourselves by the name of Jesus, people come in and they see the very same thing see the very same thing and it's like I'm tired of this I go to church to see something different I go to church to see what Jesus prayed for that they will know we are his disciples by our love I go to church to see what Jesus prayed for that they might be one even with their differences as we are one I go to church to see people who have conflict yes but they deal with it in the biblical instead of the typical way I go to church and I see something different not going to walk away I'm going to work it out I'm not going to run I'm going to resolve I'm not going to go to everybody else no I care about you and I don't like what's happening between us so I'm going to go to you so right now my prayer is to get in your garage it's to get into your living room is to get into your heart and to ask you the question, who is the person that you need to go to? What is the relationship that you need to not give up on? Who do you need to apologize to and own your part? Because until that happens, they won't know we're his disciples by our love. Until that happens, we won't be one. People need to see something different. And God said to me, Kevin, the church is going to grow when people grow up. <laughs> when we respond to conflict in the biblical instead of the typical way so my prayer right now is that we'll gather in groups and we're going to pray for reconciliation and healing we're going to sing again come to the altar and i want you to hold your block what is it called your lego block and i'm going to pray and we're going to bring the table out and I want us to do something, something different. Who here agrees that relationship matters? Could someone bring the table out? And I want all of you all to just bring your Lego pieces up here. And I want you to build something together. Are you with me? And I want this to demonstrate and to illustrate that everybody in this church is valuable. That all of us have a significant part to play. And that when we come together and lay aside our pride and our hurt. And when we come together and seek healing, we can build up the kingdom of God. We can make something that delights God's heart.
Are you with me? So as they're singing, bring your Lego pieces. Let's come together. I'm going to say it again. Let's what? And build up God's kingdom. is calling have you come to the end of yourself do you thirst for a drink from the well Jesus is calling oh come to the altar the Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was brought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Leave behind your regrets and mistakes. Come today, there's no reason to wait. Jesus is calling. Bring your sorrows and trade them for joy. From the ashes, a new life is born. Jesus is calling. Oh, come to the altar, the Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Oh, come to the altar, the Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was by with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Can we all sing, O oh, what a Savior? Savior, isn't he wonderful? Say hallelujah, Christ is risen. Bow down, bow down before him, for he is Lord of all. Hallelujah, Christ is risen. Oh, what a Savior! Oh, what a Savior! Isn't He true? Isn't He wonderful? We worship Him. Sing Hallelujah, Christ is risen. Bow down. Bow down. 
beautiful let's come together let's work together let's stay together and let's build up God's church let's get in a circle we're gonna sing make us one and we're gonna pray Make us one, Lord. Make us one, Lord. Make us one. Holy Father God, we stand here today in this circle, a circle that reflects no beginning and no ending, with arms and hands connected to a human vessel that you created, that were it just for the person that we're holding hands with, you would have sent your son to die a cruel death, to restore and to reconcile that person and each one of us to you. We thank you so much, Father God, that what you do best is reconcile because we are presented faultless before your throne because of the blood of Jesus that brought us to you, that brings us to you because of your mercy and your grace, and we're so grateful for that. Lord, this circle is our feeble attempt to tell you that we want to first be reconciled, each one of us, to you. But it's also our feeble attempt to tell the person whose hand we're holding that we want to be reconciled to them. And then, Lord, this structure that we built, this little colorful reflection of the diversity that each one of us brings to this church family. It has no form or fashion right now, 
It's waiting perhaps for us to restructure it over and over again as we, your people, come together to be the church. The church that has one foundation and that foundation is Jesus Christ our Lord. The church that you said the gates of hell will not prevail against. And so, Lord, as we stand here right now, we want you to know that we ask forgiveness for where we have failed to build each other up, where we have failed to build up this church in ways that the kingdom, that hell cannot prevail against it. But Lord, because you reconcile, we know that if we, as we ask for this forgiveness, that you have granted it already because you want this church to be a place where all are welcome, where all are lifted, where all are growing. You want this place to be one where each one of us allows the Holy Spirit to dwell within us and to reconcile us individually to you so that then we can be reconciled and be in unity with each other. So bless us, Father God. Help us to move from this place, seeing so much possibility as we look at these colorful blocks, seeing so much potential that each one of us brings, Father God, seeing so much love that you bestow through us to each other. May we show mercy, may we show grace, and may this church be one that the enemy is afraid to come back into again because he knows that we are determined the gates of hell will not prevail against all nations church because we are going to your kingdom to live forever us all of us and all of those who are connected to the hands that we are holding right now our family and this community we thank you and we praise you for the reconciliation and the blood that comes through our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Make us, make us one, Lord. Make us one. Holy Spirit, make us one. Let your love flow. Father, as we tarry just a little longer, Lord, I am in agreement with all the prayers that have gone before this one today. Father, we thank you for this time in your house of prayer. We've all seen the division that hurts your church, which is the body of Christ. We realize that unity requires a community that works together. We confess that maybe some of us on both sides have been here for the entire worship and still have not budged from our original feelings, which divided us. Help us, Lord, to set aside individual preferences so that we might reach for your kingdom. Lord, all nations does not want disunity. Do away with any distractions, any deceptions and disrespect that the enemy might encourage in us. We bind and rebuke all of that in Jesus' name. And Lord, we feel, if we feel ourselves slipping into a direction that is not from you, remind us to fast and pray. Forgive us for our stubbornness and our sinfulness. Heal the hurt we've caused each other. Help us to forgive as you do. Reconstruct those damaged relationships. Please, Lord, give us humility and gentleness, along with tolerance and more of your love. We desire to be and stay united as the family of God. We want to worship you in peace, to always seek your will and be guided by the Holy Spirit as we go about your business in these last days. We thank you and give you honor and praise, asking this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Father, we 
have need of you. For without you, we can do nothing that is worth anything good. I thank you for your amazing love. I thank you for your amazing grace. Lord, I thank you that you want us to be one. That you want us to be one as you and the Father are one. And so, Lord, I ask that you humble our hearts, humble our minds, humble our spirit, that we will recognize that we are not all that, but we are all yours. For we have surrendered our will. We will surrender our heart. We will surrender our thoughts. We will surrender our actions. We will surrender our words. That your Holy Spirit will mold and shape us into the image of Jesus Christ. That we will learn how to be light and righteousness and goodness in you. That the world will see that we're not like them. That we have a new direction a new heading. We have kingdom of heaven as our home and our destination. So Lord, help us not to treasure this world and lose our soul, but that we will treasure you, that we will look to you as the author and finisher of our faith, that we will look to you as the one who changes hearts, changing minds. Thank you for your peace. Thank you for your righteousness and holiness that you give to us. And Lord, we will humble ourselves before you. We will love as you have loved us. And we will love others because your spirit will live through us. And we will carry out your will as you give us the power to do so. Thank you for caring for this family. Thank you for caring for all nations. Thank you for caring for each one of us individually. Help us to care for one another. Help us to encourage each other to, towards love and good deeds, that we will not forsake the assembling of ourselves together, but they will walk in peace. Thanks for listening. Amen. <laughs>